it's time for In the Money, stock market action on AMA 20 News. Here's Chief Market Strategist Gareth Sotaway from InTheMoneyStocks.com. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you are all having a wonderful day on this Sunday, January 26th, 2014. Are you ready? Are you ready for a wild hour where I give you information you won't find in books or on the Internet, where the insight will ultimately make you money? All right, I'm here to enlighten you on the stock market, giving you insight only the pros of Wall Street get. I'm going to give you analysis the hedge funds pay millions for, and they sure don't want me telling you for free. All right, I'm here to unmask Wall Street. I want to tell every last secret so the playing field can be evened and you can start profiting like the top pros and insiders. This is it, folks. Your number one spot every single Sunday in the money stock market action from 12 to 1 p.m. All right, this is where I literally want to make you better than the Wall Street top hedge funds and money managers. Where else where you go to get the direct insight? It's right here on In the Money Stock Market Action. All right, folks, if you can tell, I'm pumped up today because as of last week's uh, show, I gave you guys some key analysis about an impending market drop. And not really more than a few days later, it began. And it began with a huge down move on Wall Street. Last week, the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 500 points. And remember, last week was a short week. Monday, the markets were closed in observance of Martin Luther King Day. So four days, Dow down 500 points. And I gave you guys trades last week as well. Trade setups, all of them banked big money. And we'll go over those a little bit later. All right, so again, this is where it's at, folks. And again, you have to follow the analysis I'm giving you. I want to go over all of it again today so you can fully understand how to profit in any market up or down. All right, in today's show... We're going to first cover how I knew Wall Street was going to take a tumble. All right, how I picked the trades I gave you last week that all made a lot of money. I also want to have, a, or I want to talk to you and have a very important guest join us a little bit later. All right, he's my business partner and investment genius, Nicholas Santiago. He's the other chief market strategist with me at InTheMoneyStocks.com. All right, we'll be talking to him later as he gives us exclusive insight into what only the top 1% know and what they pay big money for on market cycles. All right, that's very important. And again, a lot of you out there probably have not heard of market cycles, but it is one of the biggest things that can predict and has predicted every major up and down move over the past 100 years, if not longer. All right, we're also going to talk to him about the Federal Reserve all right. We're talking here about the Federal Reserve, which most people have hailed lately as being, you know, the savior of this market, the savior of this economy. But we're going to unveil some secrets on the Federal Reserve that will blow your mind. All right. It's time the average investor, you know, you and me, we start understanding what the purpose of the Federal Reserve is and are they really helping us? Or are they maybe hurting us much, much more than we all realize? All right, towards the end of the show today, I'm going to give my projections. I'm going to have Nick give his projections on the market as well. And we're going to discuss exactly what we think is going to happen while giving you some more trade alerts to help you make money. So stay tuned, folks. It's an, it's an exciting week. So much to talk about on this market. And let's get right into it. All right, number one, call us. Folks, if you have a question on the market, if you have any comment, if you have a stock that you want us to take a look at, give us a buzz. The number is 866-977-4820. That's 866-977-4820. Okay, and again, you can always email me at gareth at inthemoneystocks.com. All right. Number one, before we get into this, I want to just talk a little bit about the charity aspect of this show and how we try to just help all those less fortunate than us. All right, and again, what I've done is given you guys picks over the last couple weeks since this show began, and I told you straight up, I said, listen, if I'm wrong and I give a bad pick, which, again, does happen every once in a while, I donate $100 for every poor pick that I give out. All right, now, if I'm right, well, then that's great for everyone listening and trading, and I expect each and every one of you to donate a little bit. It's called giving back, and it's good karma. All right, we all have to do that, folks. It helps us in the long run. We all make a lot more money when we have that good karma behind us and we give out. All right, so again, I decided for this quarter, and remember, every quarter we're going to choose a different charity, 
And this quarter, I've, I've selected Metropolitan Ministries, who serves the poor and homeless families of Hillsborough, Pinellas, Pasco, and Polk. So, again, at the end of the quarter, whatever money has been accumulated, that's going to be where it goes. So I'm excited to announce that, and I hope a lot of you guys out there are willing to give a little bit back to help those less fortunate than us. Okay, let's talk right off the bat, folks, about last week's action. What on earth happened in the market? Because right on Friday, Dow down 318 points, NASDAQ down 91, S&P down 38. Now, how did I know this was going to happen? I'm going to reveal the secrets right now. All right, number one. The 1850 level on the S&P 500 that I've been screaming about nonstop for the last, oh, I don't know how long, probably the last three weeks since the, since the new year. All right, one thing I was noticing is right into the end of the year, on December 31st, the last trading day of the year, we saw the markets slam up and go into that 1850 level. They stalled right there and stopped. All right. Then the first trading day of the new year, the markets had a big reversal. All right. That is very important for those of us that are technicians to see that reversal coming after a final big push up. It tells us that there's a potential top put in place. All right. Fast forward a couple weeks later. All right. A couple Wednesdays ago, the market broke above that, but it only did it intraday and it couldn't stay above it into the close. That was another signal to me that this market had a major resistance level at 1850. All right, next up, what do we have? We had the key market testing it again with a gap up last week, which was immediately slammed and sold into. All right, and this market, again, just went straight down that day. Didn't really collapse like it did the last couple days of the week, but for the most part, it just showed us that 1850 level was a major resistance level. And, and as a technician, I'm reading this. My business partner, Nick, we're reading this together. We're seeing, hey, listen, this market is running into major resistance here. And the selling that was coming off that 1850 level was what's called distribution. Distribution is where the institutions are selling. All right, and you have to be able to read between the tape, between the lines here and see that. We do that. We pass that information along to you. And I said it to you the last few weeks. So you all should have been prepared. So we have institutional selling. We have a major resistance level. Then you had a triangle pattern, which, again, is, is nothing major, but what it told me, it isolated the time frame down because we basically had the 20 MA, which is the 20 moving average, sloping up. And, again, 20 MA or 20 moving average, just to explain it in simple terms, is the average closing price for the last 20 days. All right? That's, that's the 20 MA. And you had that 20 MA rising up while the 1850 level was going sideways, creating kind of like this, this pressure cooker where the market was going to break one way or the other. With the distribution institutions unloading, you have to figure that's the way it's going to go. It's going to go down. All right, institutions don't sell unless the market's going down. I mean, it's just that basic. All right, in any case, we saw that forming. The Dow chart was identical over the last couple of years to the 1930s chart, just before a 30% drop in the markets. That was huge. Margins at all-time highs. What's margin? Margin is the amount of money being borrowed by average investors to invest. Borrowing. We're not talking about just cash on hand here that someone has in their account. They were actually borrowing money. All right, this was a key signal as well. All right, when people start borrowing money and it's at an all-time high, that's not good, folks. Not when the average investor is doing it. Think contrarian there. Think the opposite. And sure enough, what do we have? We had the market then with this margin. When, the la when was the last time margin was at an all-time high? 2007. Before that, 2000. Think about the market collapses after those periods. All right. Mutual, inf mutual fund inflows were high. That's the small investor investing again. And remember, when the small investor gets in, guys, I hate to say it, but it's too late. We need to be ahead of that curve. Each and every one of you needs to learn from this radio show in the money stock market action and be ahead of that. All right, the Federal Reserve's cutting back on printing money. The markets don't like that. Earnings have been south. I've talked about the retail stocks lately, uh, how ugly those earnings are. We've seen continued weak earnings. And again, one last thing here. The market was too quiet. All right, there was no kind of iffiness. It was just kind of placid. It was just slow and steady. And when kind of they say it's the calm before the storm, you have to think about that as an average investor too. So these things combined helped me see that this market was nearing that collapse, which we did get. And again, we're going to take a little radio break here, a little commercial break, but I just want you guys to understand where I came up with this information, how it helped me achieve what it did, and call out the calls that I gave. So again, guys, my name is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. You're listening to In The Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. I'll talk to you soon. 
Now back to In the Money Stock Market Action on AMA 20 News. Here's Gareth Soloway. Welcome back, everybody. So, again, we just talked about reasons why I could see the writing on the wall, and I passed them along to you. And I, my, my only hope, honestly, is that some of you guys at least pulled your money out of the market prior to that and were able to, even if you didn't make money, at least protect your, your assets, protect your stock investments as they were being pulled into cash. Now, what I want to go over here quickly before we get to, into talking to my business partner and chief market strategist, Nicholas Santiago, is I just want to go over some of those plays from last week that I do every week. And again, I gave you guys four trades again last week, and we're just going to briefly go over them. I want to talk about the rewards that they gave out. And the number one play was the shorting of the S&P 500. Now, just to reiterate for those of you that are new investors, shorting is where you're betting on a stock or a market or any, any investment vehicle that it's going to go down. All right, so remember, as an investor, you have two options. You can go long, which would be buying a stock, or you can go short, where the stock, again, will make you money if it goes down. And institutions do this every single day, so I encourage every investor to think of it like that. Most people think, oh, I can't you know, go short or, oh, I don't know how to do it. If the investors aren't doing it and the institutions are, that's a problem. That's a disadvantage to you. So remember, just like placing a bet, you can place it on red, you can place it on black, one or the other. You can do the same thing with any stock or any market. All right, so last week I talked about shorting the S&P 500. That was at uh, 1838.70, 1838.70. It dropped 48 points in four trading days. That's huge, folks. For a market, the S&P 500 to drop 2.63%, huge. The next play was TZA to buy it. All right, buying it at 1663, it went up 98 cents or 6%. The next play was shorting Win Win Resorts. We all know about the casino player there. And that closed at 215.99 prior to the alert and it dropped $22.85. That's 10.6% gain. The last one was corn, which is just the, basically the commodity corn, but in ETF form, symbol C-O-R-N, and that had a nice bullish pattern. And honestly, that was a small gainer, only 13 cents gain, but nonetheless, it did pay a little bit of money if you invested. So great job, four for four there, knocking them out of the park. And I just want to say this, if you invested just $10,000 in each of those plays, last week in four trading days, you would have made $1,960. $65. If you did that every single week of the year, 52 weeks, you would have made $102,000. All right, that's on a $40,000 investment or a 255% return. Now, I'm not guaranteeing or saying anything like that that I can perform like that every week, but I'm telling you right now, it's better to be on the side of the institutions and know their shady strategies and use them to your benefit rather than miss out on it. Okay? All right, guys, let's get into our next segment here. I want to introduce you to uh, a man that has made his life's work to pull the curtains on Wall Street secrets, all while helping the average investor profit in any market up or down. Nick Santiago, he's the other as chief market strategist and co-owner of InTheMoneyStocks.com. Nick and I developed the PPT strategies, which are our proprietary trading methods. Um, we used to sit in a trading room together trading, watching other traders and investors get their money stolen by Wall Street. We studied hard for years and slowly pulled the curtains back on Wall Street. We found winning methods and ultimately decided it would be our life's work to teach smaller investors how to profit. These methods have a better success rate than the top hedge funds and money managers out there. So again, folks, we're bringing it to you for free live. His knowledge in regards to cycles is second to none. What he will tell you today are the things Wall Street does not want you to know. Welcome, Nick. How are you doing today? Uh, very good. Thank you for having me on today, Gareth. I appreciate it. Oh, no pl problem. It's great to have you here. So let's get right into cycles. Uh, most of our listeners have really never heard of what a cycle is. Can you give us some basic information? Yeah. Uh, well, cycles basically are a repetition of time. If you just look at your simple watch on your hand right now, you'll see that 60 seconds equals a minute, 60 minutes equals an hour, 24 hours equals a day. Uh, just look at the uh, lunar cycle. Every 29 days, we go through a new moon, full moon phase. Uh, these cycles are all around us, yet somewhere along the line, uh, man forgot to, somehow forgot uh, how to use them. So uh, if you know time and you know uh, the time factors that are involved, especially in the stock market, there's uh, big money to be made there. Plus, you can, as you mentioned before, you can also protect your profits in big downturns. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do 
in 2007, as you well know, is call the stock market top to the day. And that was all done by using cycles. Uh, again, there were a lot of combination of different cycles in play. But the truth of the matter is when you can combine all of these different cycles and they all match up into one time frame or one time zone, as I like to call it, that is uh, very, very powerful. And uh, it really is a, a winning, proven method uh, to make money in the stock market as well as protecting your capital on the downside. Wow, that's that's really interesting, and, and I kind of liken that in a way. You know, what, one thing Nick just said that I thought was great is is you know we've gotten away from our roots. You know, we've we've forgotten about how much cycles influence us and how they are all around us. And so it's almost like you know we we take a bunch of drugs hoping to cure something when all we have to do is eat a little healthier type thing, go back to the roots and be natural. Very interesting. So how would you uh, how would investors use cycles for investing? I mean, the average investor out there. Well, the average investor out there uh, can use cycles in many, many different ways. One of the best ways of, of doing it is to look at the past. And when you find out what happened in the past, understand that it can happen again. One of the cycles that we used to predict the 2007 top was to go back 100 years. And if you go back and you look at uh, what happened in 1907, that was one of the greatest stock market crashes prior to the 1929 stock market crash. So if you fast forward just 100 years later, you get 19, uh, 2007, which uh, marked the 2007 banking crisis. Ironically, the crisis that happened in 1907 was also a bank, banking crisis, and uh, it happened with the Knickerbocker Trust. So uh, we see how these cycles repeat, and, and we can almost look back and say, if there was a banking crisis then, there could be a banking crisis uh, in the future. And sure enough, that was the case. In fact, when I uh, figured out that cycle, I actually figured out six different banking crises that took place with, with former cycles that matched up to the October uh, 1907 time frame. So it, it really gave me, uh, uh, put the odds in our favor, so to speak. And that's essentially what trading is. It's just putting the odds in your favor. Uh, you become essentially uh, an odds maker. And uh, the odds were really stacked in our favor that the market would collapse. Absolutely. And I think that's the important thing for our listeners to remember is, listen, the institutions have the odds in their favor and they make sure it's it's hugely in their favor so we need to start taking that back and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about cycles today because we all need to hear this stuff now whether or not you use it or, or start to learn more about it that's up to you but you need the ability to have that information at your beck and call and we're here to give that to you guys absolutely just one more uh, thing I wanted to mention guys again if you have a question on cycles anything for Nick or myself uh, on stocks whatever feel free to give us a call at 866-977-40 820. And again, you're listening to In the Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. So let's get into the next question I had. So do institutions use cycles to make money while the little investor suffers without, the mon without that knowledge? Not all institutions uh, use cycles, but many of them do. Uh, many of the big, big, large banks, uh, global, global banking institutions, uh, Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan, I'm sure that they have uh, tremendous insight on this. Uh, if you look at the Rothschilds, uh, they're very insightful, very smart people. That's why they're the richest people in the world. Um, I'm certain that they are using cycles. But cycles are not just for the, the privileged. They're for everybody. If we would just take the time to learn them and understand them, they're all around us. Like I said, just on our wristwatch, we could just see, you know, we could watch the little hand go around the big hand. And, uh, you know, it, it just never ends. Um, so they're, they're available for everybody. Do we want to apply our knowledge and uh, our time to learn them and study them? So I always like to tell everybody, it doesn't matter what anybody does. We all have the ability to learn this stuff. And uh, do we want to take the time uh, to really uh, put into it? I put in countless hours. I, I, I couldn't tell you how many hours. I, I'm fascinated by the, by the subject, and it's my passion, and I'm still studying it uh, each and every day. Excellent. Yeah, and, and one thing I would just recommend to our listeners, you know, next time you're walking around, just take note of the different cycles that you're just seeing. I don't think any of us realize it, but what Nick said is great about, you know, the, the seconds on your clock and, uh, you know, a couple other things like that. I mean, even the changing seasons. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, just things like that I think are fascinating. All right, so... What I want to do now is just talk one more, a couple more questions on cycles here. Um, can, you, can you give us some analysis on or some insight into who was the first person in history to start really using cycles, at least in the U.S.? Well, 
I have to tell you, I believe that uh, William Delbert Gann, a, a man by the name of W.D. Gann, was uh, one of my favorite uh, people to study as far as cycles go. Uh, he had such insight and tremendous insight of the past. He was a, 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 a tremendous historian, mathematician, and um, another guy was Jesse Livermore. Jesse Livermore, believe it or not, used to use cycles all the time. He was able to predict when there would be big earthquakes and big wars and and things of uh, of that nature take place before they even happened. And uh, I'm not saying that everybody needs to predict that, uh, but what you what you do want to do is you, you want to know when there's an, an impending crisis about to happen. I mean, and that's that's really what's most important. Absolutely, and it just makes me think about situations in you know 2007, 8, and 9 where I heard about retirees losing all of their money, you know, or, or having to go back to work. It's such a sad situation, and if you knew a you know a, a cycle was coming into play in 2007, just to pull your money into cash, and just even think about that. Think about buying at the lows in 09. S and P's up 150 percent since then. I mean, if you had done that, uh, hindsight's 2020. But with the help of cycles, you can actually predict that. Amazing stuck uh, stuff. Well, we were able to do that <laughs> yeah exactly 100 percent and, and the funny thing is too i mean nick and i always chuckle about this but you know we had institutions calling us crazy and, and all that kind of stuff in those days and uh you know big money managers and so forth they were they were laughing at us and 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 saying you guys are nuts to be calling for this big collapse in 07 and sure enough history history kind of proved us right on that one um, but anyways, in, in regards to um, cycles can anything postpone a cycle like for instance the federal reserve's printing a ton of money um, they're trying to kind of get us out of the the horrible recession or, or almost depression that we were in for many years. I mean, is there any way to postpone a cycle? Not really. Um, it, it, it may be able to uh, take the effects away in, in some regard, but there really isn't anything that can postpone a major cycle when you have a cluster of cycles all hitting at the, tam- at the same time zone. All right, guys, and we'll be back in a couple minutes here, but let's just take a quick breather. This is In the Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. Here's Gareth Soloway with more In the Money Stock Market Action on AM820 News. Welcome back, everybody. Great to have you listening to us on this Sunday. A couple things I want to go over. Number one, um, the number again, 866-977-4820. If you have any question or comment or any stock you'd like us to take a look at, we'd be more than willing to check that out for you. Um, We're going to finish up with cycles, but we do have a caller on the line. Jerry from Omaha, Nebraska, calling in. Hey, welcome to the show, Jerry. Oh, we might have lost Jerry, so we'll try to get him back, folks, and we're just going to continue and finalize up. On... Hello. Oh, hey, there you are, Jerry. How are you? Hey, yes, I am. Hey, I'm great. Thanks for uh, your program, and I, I catch you on YouTube all the time. Oh, that's I wanted fantastic. To ask you, I wanted to ask you about uh, my favorite stock right now and its pattern. It's uh, the Hartford. And the pattern, and its uh, symbol is H I G, and I'll uh, I'll drop off and listen to what you have to say about it. Excellent, thank you, Jerry. Appreciate the call. Yeah, so it looks like the Hartford, with everything else last week, kind of took a little bit of a tumble there. Um, just off the bat, I'm noticing that around thirty-two dollars. Uh, by the way, right now the stock's trading at thirty-two seventy-seven per the close on Friday. But looks like there's a little support around the two hundred moving average, around thirty-two even number. So right off the bat, I would say that would be something. I'm just trying to look quickly and see if we have. Yeah, there is some support there. So, yeah, I would look at that area number one. So 32, maybe a pierce of 32, 3190 to 3195. Um, anything you see, Nick, in that chart? No, well, that's going, to be the first, that's going to be the first support level that I'm actually seeing as well. Uh, prior to that, then we're going to have to look down here at that low point, uh, which would be, basically $30.44. You're going to have a lot more support at that level as well. So uh, those, would be, those would be your two first uh, major support levels. Uh, also, watch the S&P 500 right now. If the S&P starts to flush a little bit more, then just understand that that 200 moving average is susceptible to being pierced, and then you would look at the next lower level. Excellent, excellent. So right off the bat, keep an eye on that that first level, that 32 area, and then 30, 
and a half as your potential second support. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more in our, our final segment today a little bit later about where the market's going to go as well as what are our new picks. And I think that might give you some clarity on whether or not you should play it at first support at the 32 area or maybe wait patiently for the second support. All right. Great, great question. Thank you, Jerry, again. All right. So just going back into cycles, which is going to segue us into the Federal Reserve, you know, we're, we're talking about cycles. And, you know, one last thing I wanted to ask Nick here is, you know, are we at that next big cycle pivot point here? Are we into this new cycle? And, and should we be all think that this beginning move down in the markets could be the start of something bigger? Yes. <laughs> uh, to, to be quite frank, uh, yes. 2014, uh, 2013 was a very bullish year, and we, we were expecting that. Uh, if you just go back and look at the 10-year cycle, 10 years earlier in 2003, it was almost a straight-up year. Uh, the market bottomed out in 2003 in the month of March. It made a higher low, and it zoomed up all the way into uh, January of 2004. Uh, this time around, we pretty much had a very, very similar scenario, especially with all the money printing that's going on by the central bankers, not just the Federal Reserve, but all of them, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank. Uh, so 2014 is where the major headwinds come into play. Uh, as Gareth had mentioned earlier, with all the, um, the people jumping in, the public, I should say, jumping into the market now, it's definitely the wrong time. You have to, there's a lot of money to be made in 2014, but you have to know what you're doing. Uh, it's not going to be so easy as just buying a S&P 500 index fund, and, uh, the spiders, and just letting it ride. Uh, 2014 is going to be choppy, rocky. It's going to be filled with volatility and excitement, and you're really going to need to know what you're doing. Interesting, and I think one thing to let our listeners know is we specialize in what's called swing trading at InTheMoneyStocks.com, both Nick and I, and we make more money when there's volatility, when there's up and down moves, because we jump in stocks for a week or two, and then we exit them and look to buy something or short something else. So again, if you are interested, definitely come check us out at InTheMoneyStocks.com. There's a seven-day free trial to the Research Center, which is geared towards investors and swing traders, and really good for almost everyone out there. All right, so let's get into the Federal Reserve, because I, I think of all things, one thing that struck me lately is how the Federal Reserve has been hailed as this savior. I mean, you know, you, you would think they were almost in that godlike scenario because of how much, you know, Congress is just bowing to them and, and everyone's just talking about how, what a great job Ben Bernanke did. But what concerns me here is that, you know, we've seen these type of things before and it never ends well. I mean, the Fed, again, we'll talk about it in a minute, but they've really created almost every bubble out there, which has then collapsed. So why are we now hailing them again as the saviors? A couple things I want to talk about now, and one thing comes into the would it shock you to know category. The Federal Reserve is not a government institution. All right? It's a private bank. Now, if you think about this, uh, this is what really shocks people and what shocked me. So if they're a private bank, right, so they're a private bank, that means they don't have to open their books to anyone uh, without – lawyers and, and, and judges being involved, and they basically can fly over everything else. They are that entity that just gets away with whatever they want, yet at the same time, the president you know, nominates the chairman and the presidents of the Federal Reserve. So you have this weird mix where the Fed doesn't get to or doesn't have to show their books, but at the same time, the government and the president are nominating who they want to run it. So it's almost like they can do what they want in the name of the government and what the government wants, but you don't get to see what they're doing like a public institution is. It's almost reminding me of like, in a weird way, the NSA and what's been going on there, how, you know, they can kind of go behind everyone's back and really they are associated with the government, but, you know, they almost are acting like a private entity there. So keep that in mind, folks. I mean, there's some weird stuff with the Federal Reserve, and, and they've been around for a long time. One thing I want to mention, uh, last year, the Federal Reserve sent $77.7 .7 billion to the government. That's a profit. We're talking profits, guys. That's more money than any stock makes. In fact, I think um, it actually is – if you add up all the, the bank stocks out there, the Goldman's, the JPM's, the Bank of America's, and so forth, I believe that profit the Federal Reserve turned is more than any of those combined, if you add them all up. And, I mean, that's shocking to me. So, so they're just kind of in there with no oversight. The government – the president's appointing these guys, so you know they're doing what the president wants, but nothing is – being revealed, and I know Ron Paul has tried to get the audit the Fed bill going and so forth, which I hope at some point is. But in any case, let's get into a little bit of the finite details of the Federal Reserve with Nick here. So when was the Federal Reserve formed, Nick, and, and what was the purpose? 
The Federal Reserve came into power in December 1913. Uh, believe it or not, we just hit a 100-year anniversary, so there goes a cycle. I don't think the Federal Reserve will really ever be the same again uh, in, the next, in the coming years. Uh, but um, basically, we put the Federal Reserve in, how they were able to even force their way into power is, is pretty interesting. It happened from that 1907 stock market crash. Uh, basically, the bankers got together, the big bankers. Um, it was basically the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Rothschilds, and, and others. And uh, they all got together, and they said, hey, uh, the Warburgs included, uh, they got together, and they said, we're going to let's, – let's form this, this entity where we'll, we, we can control interest rates. We'll set the interest rate policy for the United States of America. And um, they promised uh, the president, uh, Woodrow Wilson at the time, they also promised U.S. Congress, they said, hey – We'll never have another stock market crash. We're never going to go through any of these volatile periods. We're just going to slowly inflate the money supply, and that will cause inf gradual inflation, and things will always be uh, very, very easy uh, for the country. And as we all know, 1929 came around, and um, the stock market tumbled and crashed, and uh, basically the country went through a very, very long depression. Uh, we also know that uh, in 1987, the stock market crashed, 1957, the stock market crashed, 2000, the stock market crashed, 2007, the stock market crashed, and there, was, there were other smaller crashes from, from uh, the inception of the Federal Reserve. Long story short, um, it's basically uh, they have done a lot of good things. I don't want to just totally rip them apart. But every time they seem to come back in and solve a crisis, it, it, they're still the, the ones that set the fire, and then they get – uh, they're the arsonists, and then they get credit for putting the fire out. <laughs> so it's um, it, it's a never-ending cycle with them. But I think you're going to find it interesting to know the one the 100 year anniversary has just taken place of the Federal Reserve, and I think things are about to start changing uh, in that organization. Wow, that is interesting. The 100 year cycle again coming back to kind of haunt it, haunt us. Um, so I think you would agree with me that the Federal Reserve, like you said, has, has pretty much created every bubble in history. Can you give us, like, since 2000, I mean, what did they do in 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst that kind of created the 07 one? And then what are they doing now, essentially, that could create the next one? Well, sure. Back in 2000, when the dot-com and the tech wreck occurred, uh, basically what they did was they went on an easy money spree. And that's what they always do. That's their primary uh, primary uh, source to get the economy going again, they lower interest rates. And back then, they lowered interest rates all the way to 1% in 2003. And then uh, they gradually tried to increase interest rates by a quarter, a quarter point or 25 basis points from there on. Uh, basically, they caused that credit boom and the housing boom and the housing market took off and people were uh, getting cheap money and people were borrowing money out of their home. And, and any time you the, uh, really just uh, going higher because of buybacks. They're going higher because of all of the, uh, the cheap money they could borrow. And um, basically, if, if that cheap money comes to an end, what happens to asset prices? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, could we have started to see that already just this past week with the big, big drops in the market? Now, one thing, you know, you were talking about asset prices, and, and this is one of those things that grinds my gears in regards to the Fed, is that, you know, they, they kind of come out there and say, oh, we're saving the day, we're saving the day. But by creating all this money and pushing up asset prices like food and energy, for instance, I mean, they're really just hurting the poor. I mean, think about, you know, the middle class and the poor struggling in this divide in, in the wealth gap, and, and it comes down to that and, and here the Federal Reserve saying, oh, we're saving the economy, but now when someone who doesn't have a lot of money goes to the store, they're paying more for, for food and also to heat their home. I mean, Nat gas, I think you saw that on Friday. I mean, Nat gas is even, even rising dramatically. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I do. I wrote an article uh, a while back, Ben Bernanke's killing old people. Um, basically, you know, the elderly don't have a chance at this stage of their life to really take on a lot of risk. And uh, basically, they live off their savings. And it, look, what, look at the interest you get on a savings account. There is none. I mean, basically, a uh, $100,000 account will probably net you 100 bucks. So, and that's in a year. So, uh, essentially, food prices uh, will go up, and they have been going up. Uh, you could just see uh, the price of, of anything that you, you eat or anything that you need, you'll see higher prices. Um, but things that you don't need, say, like a computer or an iPad or uh, a new cell phone, they'll – They'll deflate and they'll go lower. So right now the Federal Reserve is really scrambling to, to create real inflation, um, and, and basically they're not succeeding.
Wow, scary stuff, guys. Again, for all of us who have, you know, gone to the store or bought, you know, anything or energy related, it definitely, definitely knows, you know, for those of us that have done that, that it hits the pocketbook. Absolutely. So now, um, with the repercussions here, are there any repercussions of, of printing $4 trillion like the Federal Reserve? I mean, that's so much money, right? Repercussions uh, can be disastrous. Um, we're not the only, cent or I should say the Federal Reserve is not the only central bank that's printing money. So basically you have the Bank of Japan printing even more money than the Federal Reserve, and Japan is only one-third the size of the economy of the United States. You also have the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, and just look, in, look at the Bank of Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, they're, they're throwing them around a million dollars just to buy a, a loaf of bread. So a million Zimbabwe dollars, that is. So you think that, like, I mean, you know, in some respect that's kind of happening here or could happen more so here? Oh, sure. Um, ultimately, um, when the debt ratios become too high for many of these nations, including Japan, which I think is going to be the first country that really falls, uh, their debt load is just becoming so severe. I, I really don't know the exact timing of it at the moment, but I am working on it. But when Japan falls, I think it's, it's the party's going to be over. Domino and effect kind of the, thing? Yeah, I mean, we're starting to see the first glimpse of it, even uh, with the Chinese banks right now. The Chinese banks, they're, they're constantly having to throw liquidity into their marketplace because of all this shadow banking that's going on. Essentially, it's a Chinese subprime crisis, which is happening. So, um, yeah, you're, you're seeing it in Turkey. We saw Argentina this past weekend have come into a currency crisis as well. South America has a history of that happening. Uh, over and over. Uh, Brazil is feeling inflation. Um, and, and I think that you have all this, this, these distortions going on all over the world right now. And people are starting to realize, whoa, maybe we can't print our way out of this. So, so just before we head into our next commercial break, I guess the big question that all of our listeners are probably having is, like, how do we protect ourselves? Like, all right, I mean, is pulling it to cash enough? I mean, that's obviously an option. Are there any better ways to invest where we could make more money instead of just being in cash? Well, I, I do think um, right now the trading opportunities are your best way to continue to, to create wealth. Um, the second best way would be to protect yourself, have some gold, have some silver, have some precious metals, have some jewels. Uh, I, I always think that that is, is, is always another way of, of protecting yourself. doesn't mean that gold can't go down or silver won't go lower. But if push came to shove and uh, all the currency markets blew up by some chance, and I think the dollar would be the last one to go. So I still believe it is the safest play as people have still have a ton of faith in the United States and ultimately will revert back to U.S. dollars. But just in case that currency went, you're going to need precious metals. So diversification, folks, is key in being in some cash. And obviously, you know, the dollar sounds like the best way to go as of now. But all right, on that note, folks, we're going to step aside here. Um, just a reminder that you're listening to In the Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. And this is Gareth Soloway and Nicholas Santiago, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. <laughs> Now back to In the Money Stock Market Action on AMA 20 News. Here's Gareth Soloway. Welcome back, everybody. As uh, we wind down here, I want to make sure you guys understand this last segment I saved because I think it's the most important because it's the way we're going to make money in the coming week and give you guys the market projections that will ultimately let you either be safe or hopefully make some make some extra money. And and listen, when it all comes down to it, you know what we've talked about today. I just want to be the informer. I want to come to you guys and tell you what Wall Street's not telling you, what the rest of the media is not telling you. You know, there's no reason we need another just average financial show out there. They're, they're a dime a dozen at this point. So we're here to really kind of give you that new view to help you guys understand what's going on there so you can at least prepare or navigate through it and hopefully profit. So, again, it's really a pleasure to do this, and I, and I love it, and I know Nick does too. We just love having people open their minds and starting to see things and you know we've changed lives on in the money stocks.com i can't tell you how many times people have come to us and said you know oh i can pay for my kids college education now or oh i can retire early and you know that's really why we do what we do here so what i want to do now in the final segment here is go into what we project on this market this week because again last week we had a huge fall in the market and honestly most people in the media in the financial media especially were saying most likely the market 
markets are going to go lower this week. But honestly, I'm not so sure. And I'm, I know you might say, wow, that's, you know, considering how they were, you know, ripping apart or saying what the Fed's go, going through and what they're doing, you know, I can't believe they might actually be slightly on the bullish side. But remember, Nick and I are short-term traders. All right, we're people that will buy a stock for a week or two, and then we'll get rid of it. So if we think that the market might bounce this week, hey, we might be buying a couple stocks this week and holding them for a week and then get rid of them next week before the market continues its path down. And that, again, is how you have exponential gains. One thing I wanted to mention Last year, in 2013, we had a net gain of over 500% at InTheMoneyStocks.com. Now, that's granted if you had put every last dollar in every single play, but it's still pretty amazing. I mean, if you had only put just 10% of your money in each play, you still would have made over 50% last year with us at InTheMoneyStocks.com. And that's just swing trading back and forth, you know, buying for a couple weeks, selling for a couple weeks. So in any case, let's get into it. So, Nick, I'll ask you right off the bat, what do you think about the market this week? I mean, is there a possibility we bounce? Oh, yeah, there's definitely a possibility that we bounce simply because you have a, a Federal Reserve FOMC meeting on Wednesday. So uh, a lot of people will come and th come in, institutional investors will come in and say, hey, Ben Bernanke's going to save the day. Maybe he'll uh, come back in and, and uh, start printing more money again. Maybe he'll say we're not going to taper that $85 billion a month that we're currently printing. Uh, last month uh, he did, or I should say uh, recently, they, the Federal Reserve said they were going to taper uh, by $10 billion a month their $85 billion uh, money pro program. So, um, yeah, there are reasons to think there's going to be a bounce. Plus, you have a lot of stocks hitting very, very good technical support levels. And that's, again, why we really don't care about the news. We really just care about what the technicals are telling us. Absolutely. And that's so true, folks. I mean, as soon as you start listening to the news, emotion comes into play. And emotion is the one thing as a trader or an investor that will put you on the wrong side of the market. So I definitely encourage you keep out the emotion and just focus in on the facts. All right, now a couple things that I was thinking about here. Number one, the markets had a big sell-off on Friday, down 318 points on the Dow. Now, one thing you have to remember is emotion, just like I mentioned, is a big player. So on Friday... No one wanted to hold over the weekend because they all feared, and fears an emotion, that the markets would crash on Monday, you know, because maybe something in Argentina develops even more, maybe in China. And what I'm going to tell you right now is that there's always a small chance that does happen, but it's more so on Friday, the big sell-off late in the day, especially that people just didn't want to take that risk. So they got out. Now, if we come into tonight, into Sunday night, into Monday morning, and there really hasn't been any sort of new development, major panic going on, then I do agree. I think you could see the market bounce. Plus, everyone's going to start saying that we have a potential Fed meeting on Wednesday or announcement on Wednesday, and maybe they won't taper another $10 billion. Maybe they will you know, actually add QE, you know, add money to the, to the printing presses. So so, yeah, I mean, anyways, I think that's one thing to think of. And I just want to go to a caller here. We just have another caller calling in. I'm curious what they have to say. So, uh, Mark from Tampa, welcome to the show. Hey, Gareth, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I love the show. Uh, thank you so much for helping uh, us smaller investors learn how to navigate the market and profit. Um, I haven't heard some of the things you've said on the radio, but it all makes sense, and it's opening my eyes a little bit to it. Oh, that's great to hear, man. That is great. What can I do for you today? Um, I won't take up too much of your time, but I wanted to let you know that I took your four trade last week and I invested some money. I made about 1500 and I wanted to let you know that I'm going to donate 10% of that to the charity that you suggested. Wow, that is fantastic, Mark. Thank you so much. Honestly, that means a lot that, you know, not only are we helping people make some money out there, but people are willing to give a little bit back. And uh, do you have a charity that you have in mind or anything like that? I'll go to the charity you've chosen uh, to donate to. Oh, that's... that's that's fantastic. The uh, Metropolitan Ministries, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, again, sure, you know, I appreciate it. yeah, thank you again, Mark. Really, really appreciate that. And, and, you know, I can't stress it enough, folks, is, you know, it's giving back that enables us to make headway in life and, and do better. And I think Nick would agree with me that, you know, the more you give back, the more you get. It's, it's a nice 100%. rotating thing. So, so, again, thank you so much, Mark. And you know what? I'm going to match that 150 right there, and I'm going to throw that into the pot. Even though I was all right, you know, it's, just, it's a great gesture, and I appreciate it. And I encourage any of you guys out there, feel free to donate a little bit, again, if you've made some money or if you took some of the advice here. And I promise you it will come back around tenfold. All right, so let's get back into what we have going on here. So we're looking at, again, watch the markets, I think, tonight and, and overnight and see if anything new arises kind of out of Argentina or South America as well as China. 
China. If things stay, stay quiet, you could see the market inching up just a little bit, especially ahead of the Federal Reserve meeting. Also, I want to point out that Apple reports earnings Monday after the close. So if their earnings are better than expected, you could see a tech pop on Tuesday as well. And again, we'll have a lot of earnings this week. I believe Google reports and uh, um, you know, there's a bunch of other tech places. I'm not sure if Amazon reports this week. It might be next week. But those are some big things. What else are you seeing in the markets, Nick? Anything? Uh, I'm seeing a lot of opportunities for short-term bounces right now. So with this big sell-off, we want to be able to take advantage of uh, the short-term support levels. One stock that I'm looking at in particular is Costco. Uh, in fact, I believe my wife might be shopping there today. But uh, when it gets to around the 110 level, I think uh, traders can uh, jump in that one. I'll be a buyer there. And uh, we'll look for about a $5 pop on that. If she's, if she's shopping there, I'm buying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know my wife. <laughs> but um, all right, yeah, that's that's a good one. So Costco, C-O-S-T, keep an eye on that one this week, guys. I have a couple others that I'm going to use, and these are going to be my four plays for this week, and I want to kind of talk them through with you guys. So number one, I like RIG for a bounce this week, R-I-G. I like the, the sell-off that we've seen on the daily chart, and uh, we're coming right into a nice double bottom from last October. October, And double bottom, again, folks, is, is coming into a level where it, it was a former level. So if you had a, a major low and then the stock went up from 20 to 50, but now it's back to 20 again, that's known in the technical world as major support or at least a good double bottom. So considering it's oversold, considering I think the markets are due for a little bit of a bounce, I'm going to throw my money behind a RIG, symbol RIG. The closing price on Friday was $44.25. So by this coming Friday, we're going to see if it's above. As I said, if it is and some of you guys play it, I hope you donate a little bit to charity. And if I'm wrong and I gave a bad call, then I'm the one that's going to be donating. And, you know, like I did today, folks, I'm I'm not against donating as well if I'm right. It's just I just want to get you guys to participate. I mean, I think that's the key. It's like I don't want it to be all me. I want us to be a group that can change the world, and I want you guys to be a part of changing the world. So that's there. Um, CORN was a play, corn. I've talked about that. I've actually had that play for a couple of weeks. I continue to think the chart's nice, so I'm going to stick with it. So, again, it closed on Friday, CORN, corn, at $30.76. So I'm going to stick with that one, and we'll see if it gets higher. Um, S&P 500. All right, this is going to be a little caveat. All right, a little caveat. I need you guys to listen up real closely. I am going to like the S&P 500 if it hits 1775. I have a key level around 1775. I'm hoping for maybe a little bit of a gap down tomorrow or a little sell early to get it down there and then maybe a reversal. So only if the S&P hits 1775 uh, tomorrow or Tuesday we can do as well. Then I'm in that one to the long side. And GE is my last one here, folks. GE, General Electric. I really happen to like this chart. There's a major gap fill here at um, approximately 2470-ish or so, 24.75 plus the 200 daily moving average. All right, when two symbols or two signals like that coincide, it's usually a fantastic opportunity for a bounce. Plus, it's General Electric. I mean, again, you got to think that that stock has fallen already 10% in like the last week or two. It's due for a bounce. So GE looks really good to me. That's actually one of my favorites. But on on GE. Keep an eye on this. I want it to get into $24.75 for that at long to be initiated for that buy. All right. So, again, guys, bottom line is both Nick and I had a pleasure being with you today. It has been a true, amazing trek here over the last few weeks since the beginning of the year, and we are not going to stop. We are going to bring you every little nuance of information that the institutions and big money managers do not want you to know. We're going to give you the insight that can make you money. So, last but not least, folks, again, you're listening to in the money stock market action hosted by Gareth Soloway, chief market strategist at Nick at uh, in the money stocks.com. And I'm joined today by Nick Santiago, chief market strategist at in the money stocks.com. Take care guys.